So, bonsoir, uh, Mr. Maurice. So, welcome <laughs> in this uh, symposium. So, uh, I'm Alex from uh, Alliance Française of Jaipur, and uh, everyone uh, can wait to have any answers about uh, Mars. So, I let you uh, introduce yourself uh, and your activities, and after you can uh, start the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, th <clears throat> thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. And I will start sharing my screen. And, and while doing that, I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a very interesting symposium. And thanks, Alexi, for this uh, great talk. And uh, it, it's good to start from the future, which is what Alexi was doing. And now we're going to come back to what we're doing now. And how do we prepare for that future? And I hope I can answer a few questions about life outside of Earth. Um, um, do, do, do these uh, people outside exist? Uh, we'll talk about that, of course. So, um, sorry, sharing my screen. Give me a second. I do that. Okay. No problem. So, yes, if you have uh, any question to ask, uh, please uh, put uh, write your question in the QR section, AR section, and uh, Mr. Maurice uh, will answer your question at the end of uh, his uh, presentation. Thank you. Yes, I will do so. So if I may start, uh, I'm Sylvester Maurice, an astrophysicist. I've been working as a planetary scientist here in Toulouse. Um, I work on a very different planet starting in Saturn, Jupiter, went to Mercury, spent a lot of time on the moon, and thanks to uh, to Alexi for uh, bringing us back to the moon. And I've been for uh, a couple of years now uh, on Mars. Uh, and it's really great to be on Mars because it's such a good science uh, we can do. So I'm going to uh, start and, and, and go with you over what over this, um, uh, this um, planet, red planet. By the way, can you see my uh, cursor moving around my screen? Definitely, definitely, sir. Okay, that's perfect. Be helpful. Okay, so uh, uh, I want to start with this very nice view of Mars that we took um, a few years ago uh, with a Curiosity uh, rover to show that it's a very rocky planet. Uh, it's very interesting, honestly, but it's it's kind of boring. There's not much happening. You can see some uh, sand dunes, which tell you there's an atmosphere, and indeed, there's a very uh, small atmosphere. Um, uh, very low pressure. It's a very cold planet. I can tell you that at night, very um, regularly, we get minus 90 degrees C. Um, there's no liquid water. So there's not a chance you have liquid water. It would turn into ice right away. And there's no geological activity uh, as of now. It used to be, but now um, nothing is happening. So I would say that's a boring planet. But, and back to the question I was asked, to Alexi a few minutes ago, where there are chances that uh, actually this planet is not as boring as it looks like because we can ask the question, were there ever life on Mars? Which is the uh, Martians, uh, do they ever exist? And actually that's my job, and as well as most of my uh, colleagues, is to search if Martians uh, existed in the past. Okay, to do that, uh, that science, uh, it's, it's a long way. It's a very difficult one. I'm going to explain you how we do it. So the first part is to go uh, over a little bit of uh, geometry um, to say that uh, Earth is close to the sun and not as close as Venus, but pretty close. And the next planet is Mars. So we um, we both we each on our orbit. And it just happening then today, actually for the past two weeks, we are perfectly aligned, uh, Earth, uh, Sun, and Mars. We call that a conjunction. And it's a very special time in our life. It's happening every two years. And it's a special time because we are on a holiday. Um, actually, it's even a vacation time for us now uh, for two, two and a half weeks, nearly three weeks. We cannot communicate with our, our spacecraft on Mars, so we just relax. So as a Mars scientist, I'm allowed to have uh, three weeks, so it's about three weeks of vacation every two years. It's not a lot, but it's always good to take. And it's, uh, it's this week, 
with the past week and is going to be over next week. So Mars is a line far away from Earth, as far can be almost, which is, as Alexi was mentioning, roughly 20, um, 20 minutes at the light of sp uh, the speed of light. Okay, well, this is a view that's come closer now, and this is a view of Mars. And you can see that it's a, uh, it's a very, um, it's, uh, this is a topographic, uh, topography of Mars. You can see that um, in blue, these are the low lands, which are mostly at the Northern hemisphere, plus are some big craters you can see here, Elas Basin, and then the yellow to, um, yellow to red and brown colors. These are the high um, topographic units. Uh, volcanoes, you can see here, Mount Olympus. So it's not to plus 12 kilometers. It goes further away, more than plus 25. So it's a very high, very, very high mountain. Elysium is very high too. All, um, all, the, uh, all these volcanoes are high too. But what's striking from this view is that actually the Northern Hemisphere seems more, I mean, lower by roughly five to six kilometers than the southern hemisphere. And the southern hemisphere has a lot of craters and this, so which means it's kind of an old surface. So we're going to see what it means for our science. So you can see a, a planet with many craters. So we, you can guess there's no much uh, activity at, at the surface. And by the way, probably the Earth has at that many or even more craters. But of course, uh, water, and the atmosphere and life has completely erased the memory of this uh, impact. They still exist on the moon and they do uh, still exist mostly on Mars. Okay, well, um, if I go look at it in more details now and from orbit, I can see these craters we were talking about, but the most interesting part on these views are these channels here, the fluvial channels, uh, traces of liquid water. There's certainly a time when there was liquid water at the surface of Mars. You can see a, a delta, you can see a, a river that was approximately 600 kilometers long, catastrophic flows, it means a lot of water for a very short period of time. Here, bottom right, you can see Ebersvalde uh, delta, which means the water uh, from a delta and brought some sediments with it. So you can see that um, there used to be when there was water, liquid water at the surface for a very long time because, I mean, this could take a few weeks to do, but that takes years and years to build such a fluvial delta. So we need to do a bit of physics here. I'm sorry for that, but I need to show you the triple point of water. Uh, you may remember that, uh, that temperature, that's pressure at zero degree, roughly 100 degrees C. Um, if you're here, the water will turn into um, ice and at one bar uh, on Earth, if you minus 10 degrees, minus 20 degrees, it's ice. If we go above zero, and that's the definition of zero, actually at one bar, um, it's it's liquid and above that it's vapor. So it's a triple point of, of water. And what it's, it's telling us uh, is that Mars today, as I said, it's a very low pressure. Actually, it's rough six millibar, six, seven millibar of pressure. It's, it's cold, it's far below um, minus 10, minus 20, goes on to minus 90, minus 100. So this is Mars today. I mean, it's pure physics. The only water you can have will turn into ice. This is where we are. So the question is how can we bring Mars here into the liquid uh, region of this uh, space? Well, for that, uh, there's not much you can do. You cannot change the planet uh, orbit, you cannot, you could change a little bit the obliquity, but it's 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 hard. Uh, what you need to do is to think that maybe there was a more pressure into the atmosphere, but actually, does it help? Because it's going to bring uh, mass up here, one bar of CO2, two bar of CO2, but it's not going to help. Well, actually it's not true because CO2 is a greenhouse effect, uh, a greenhouse gas, and we know that from Earth and it's terrible what's happening to us now. Uh, but we can tell from Mars, and there used to be a time uh, long ago when Mars has a denser atmosphere, maybe one bar, a little more than one bar, two bar of CO2. And because it's such a greenhouse um, a gas, it was uh, pushing uh, Mars into this direction to the point where there was liquid 
uh, on the surface of Mars. So you can see that we're talking of two planets, a planet today that is a very modern planet, uh, rocky, boring. We still see a little bit of uh, CO2 ice, we call it dry ice, with a little bit of water ice here at both poles. We can see some clouds, but um, not much is happening here. Uh, but okay, we need to work on some time scale. But about 3.6 billion years ago, um, there probably was a lot of water in the northern hemisphere, which are the lowlands, uh, a lot of uh, clouds. It was a very different planet. I, I wish we could still have this planet today, but that's not the one we have. We have the the, the other one, but maybe we can turn that to our advantage. And uh, to do that, I'm trying to compare uh, Mars and Earth. So this is a time scale of Mars uh, and on Earth. It's super, super, super um, summarized. Um, look at the Earth. Earth was born about 4.56 billion years ago as a hot planet because of the way it formed by um, accretion and then started to cool down and build up uh, an atmosphere and build up some continents and the moon and everything. And it's so hot and it's uh, it's going, uh, uh, it's cooling down to cooling down to a point where we start to have liquid water at the surface and liquid water there suddenly at probably 4.2 uh, billion years ago. And uh, well, the planet is mostly liquid water and continents, continents, but on, on the continents, not much is happening. Everything is happening in the water. And what are we going to talk about now is life. We don't know exactly when life appeared on Earth, but it's probably around 3.7, 3.9 billion years ago. Um, and that was a long, long time ago. And the, and the life's, life forms stay into the water and start to, uh, to evolve and at the same time to change uh, its uh, surrounding. And, uh, Photosynthesis was uh, pushing some uh, oxygen into the atmosphere, and then the uh, these very simple bacteria start to uh, uh, to get a, a nucleus, and they call them eukaryotes. And then, after a long, long time, probably three billion years, uh, they started to say, "Okay, maybe it's time to go outside of the water and to go on the um, on the on the." Uh, Earth itself on the continents uh, and uh, on hard ground. And then that's where our life started to completely explode. We're multicellular and now we are four side of this time. But we know that uh, this back 500, 600 million years um, old only. Before that, everything was inside of, into the water and was probably bacteria kind of uh, and getting, becoming more and more uh, complex. Of course, for people who know dinosaurs, I remind you that the dinosaurs are about here, and we are somewhere in that um, on that line. Uh, so there was life before, uh, there was uh, something happening on Earth and life before us. There was life suddenly before the dinosaurs. But um, when I look today at, Mar at Earth, sorry, I can tell this is a planet I'm looking at. It's a very, very modern planet. Well, on the contrary, Mars uh, was born at the same time, 5.56 billion years ago, has a hot surface and uh, slowly getting water, liquid water. Uh, and we've seen that just before. Uh, we think the liquid water around that time. And suddenly something happened. Probably the atmosphere has been blown off the planet by the solar wind. We don't know exactly how. We don't know what is the role of the magnetic field in this story. But for sure, that's for the last three billion years, not much happened. It's a very uh, cold and dry planet. And um, that's a boring mass I told you about. But the advantage is that because nothing has changed, when I look at a planet itself, I can look at a period of time that you can see that does not exist anymore on Earth. Earth has no memory. Earth is a very active planet. For that reason, studying Mars it's just like going back in time to study Earth. And that's why we go to Mars to understand processes that um, uh, made our life to appear on Earth. And for that, um, uh, we like Mars. It's a great planet for that. It's kind of a laboratory of our past. And to show you it's true, uh, this is a map you know very well of um, of um, of old rocks on 
earth. And it's hard to find an old rock. There are very few places where you can find rocks that are more than 2.5 billion years old. Uh, and certainly in India, for sure, uh, there's a huge uh, plateau here that, can, uh, that have a very, very old rocks, but it could also be in Canada, in Australia. If I ask you, can you find something that more than 3.6 billion years old? It's super, super difficult. You find places at 3.8. Um, and you could find a place uh, in Jack Hills at 4.4, but you're not going to find rocks. You're going to find tiny, tiny, tiny zircon, I mean, uh, mineral phases that are that old. But if I wanted to do exactly this map, and maybe one day I should do it, uh, uh, of, uh, for Mars, half of the planet would be yellow. Half would be yellow. Half would be old, uh, older than anything we have on Earth, except on a very, very few places. So compare an old planet to a young planet. They, both, they were both born on the, at the same time. That's a science we do. And for that, we've built um, a, a project, a big project, which is called the Martian Program. And that is based on the science of life. Okay. Try to find out if life ever arose on Mars. Uh, climate. I told you there's, a, there's an atmosphere today. today. It was a different atmosphere 3.2 million ago, billions ago. So it's climate of today and yesterday. About geology also, about the fact that we have fracture, we have volcanoes, do we have continents, do we have uh, tectonics, a lot of good questions on geology. And also, and that's how I reconnect with what was presented by Alexi, is to prepare for human exploration. Of course, these are four objectives. We do have uh, themes that are evolving as we as we're going on. Uh, for a long time, it was water. Try to find uh, evidences of water. Um, we did it. We did, we found them. Of course, I show, I've shown that to you. It was early. Um, I said the year of this this century. I would say. Um, uh, 2000, 2010, roughly, 2010, 2020, it was to try to prove if at some point well, um, Mars was an habitable world. And after that, 2020, 2030, which is where we are now, try to find our uh, uh, traces of life. Of course, um, and it's always very interesting when you study Mars, well, you study a little bit of Earth because there's a there's a, about greenhouse effect, volcanoes, for example, aurora, ozone. Um, so that's called comparative planetology. I want to study a little bit of Mars, a little bit of Venus, a little bit of the Moon, of Mercury, of Jupiter, and that helps me to understand better Earth and how Earth is changing with time. So that's very important too. That the theme you have here. I want to say a, a little focus on on life and and. Uh, it's hard to define life, but I'm going to define habitability first, is what are the key and driving requirements for habitability. It's to have liquid water. Uh, it's to have uh, organic chemistry around the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And these elements are the one, the building uh, blocks of life, as we understand it, uh, to put them together, to help to have a complex um, chemistry, it's hard to believe that life somewhere else could be simple. It's so complex here on Earth. We need a solvent, liquid water is good for that. We need chemical energy. And probably that's the most difficult part on Mars, a stable environment, something that lasts for a long time. And But we can, of, of course, accept some changes. But um, we, we've seen it from the Earth. Life doesn't develop in one day, take say. Uh, uh, millions a year to our slowly develop. So around this objective, we build uh, uh, many, many probes, nearly 50 probes as of now. Uh, we failed about 20 of them, which is, that's what we do in space. We fail, try again, fail, try again until it works. And then we've done flybys, which is you fly by the planet and then you start to do orbiters. You go around the planet and stay for a long time. Then you decide to land and say, okay, I'm going landing now. And then you land and stand. They're still a Viking, for example, were landers. And after they say, oh, okay, I'm good enough. I'm going to land. I'm going to drive. We call them rovers. And rovers are, are fantastic. Well, maybe we can fly. And that's what we're doing now. We fly on Mars. It's uh, We have drones. Uh, its name is Ingenuity. I'm 
going to show that. And maybe the top of the top of the top is you, you come back. Well, of course, we're not interested by our spacecraft. We like them, but they can stay there if they want. I mean, what we like to return are samples because we're sure we can um, do better science with any rock from Mars we would have here in our lab that we could do in situ. So return sample is kind of the grail of the planetary exploration. So a lot of people found that uh, this program was interesting here uh, for the last um, uh, two decades. The, the, all the projects we had uh, around Mars, um, they're almost all active still. You see that not completely. We had eight of them, orbiters. We had a, a two landers, Phoenix and InSight. We have one, two, three, four, five rovers. Um, so... It's been an amazing time the last 20, 25 years. Honestly, we, we need to be thankful to our um, managers and, and our space agencies uh, and to put us uh, on Mars. Uh, of course, looking to the future, we need a return sample, return sample for Mars. We have two of them even for Phobos. So who are the people who are doing that? They're exactly this uh, big... Um, uh, major space uh, countries, Alexei was referring to. Uh, we have uh, the US with NASA, and they have more. I mean, they have three orbiters and one, two, three, four, five uh, on the ground. They, they're amazing. They're so good. Uh, they're good. They take us, uh, they take us with them. But uh, NASA is really leading uh, the um, the exploration. We have some from Europe. From Europe, we don't call them, um, we don't call, it's not a European flag, it's the ESA flag, because it's more than Europe, and uh, Alexei was mentioning it doesn't overlap with Europe, so we have Mars Express, and we have TGO, we still have a collaboration with Russia, even if Russia was big name in space exploration 40 years ago, uh, in a recent time for planetary exploration, didn't do much, uh, but we are collaborating on TGO around um, on Mars. There's a, uh, from India, India has uh, done a, a very nice spacecraft from Mars orbiter mission, MOM, that was um, that is not functioning anymore, but it was active for many years. Uh, very interesting one. Uh, we have one here. It's not really uh, a major uh, space um, uh, station, I mean, uh, country yet. Uh, the Emirates they are very active still on this on this project. They bought a spacecraft from uh, NASA, from US, and they bought a rocket uh, and a launch from Japan. So a very interesting collaboration. And never forget China. China, they're coming strong and, and, and big, big, really big and really, really strong. I told you about the idea of doing an orbiter and I mean, flyby orbiter. Why not landing? Why not roving? And they, they've done everything in one single mission. It's called Chanwen-1. They have an orbiter, they have a lander. It's not a very active lander, but they have a rover. We'll come back to that. And the future is a return sample from um, from Japan or from one of the moon, um, Phobos, a uh, return sample from the ground uh, by China and by the US. Again, we want rocks. We do, do, do want rocks from the surface to analyze in our lab. And also... Um, uh, Europe would like to land and do uh, some good science on the surface, because you can see it's either China or the US, and we have a rover called ExoMars. So uh, today, I, 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 I'm going to talk a few of them. Just, oh, by the way, I should tell you that some of them have become inactive, if I'm not too wrong. Inside Spirit Opportunity, Phoenix is wrong after a year has stopped. A mom has stopped. The other one seems to be active. Uh, it's not because they're not actually today. They cannot um, um, rev revive themselves, but this is a status now, as far as I understand. Um, we're going today to uh, focus on the uh, rovers because we do have, uh, especially in, to in France and Toulouse, some special interest for these um, four rovers, Curiosity, Perseverance, Zorong, Exomar. They're given by the uh, landing date. Uh, Curiosity is still active. Uh, coming nearly to 11 to 12 years of uh, activities. Perseverance, it's after two years and a half, it's still active. Zorong work only for uh, a year, but it did great science. And ExoMars is not there yet. Um, it's on its way. 
as a scientist, uh, our, I, my role and as well as all our teams here is to provide, is not to be the spacecraft. This is done by uh, industry and space agency. We do provide science instruments. We've provided two our friends here on Curiosity, one on SuperCam. and we collaborated on one here with China and we have a bunch of them uh, on ExoMars. So this is our very special commitment on the surface of Mars. And we do, uh, we operate also them. Uh, sorry, I should not go there. It's the, actually these two ones only. We operate them um, on the surface of, uh, of Mars. Well, let's start with the first one. The first one is Curiosity. It's not the first one, but it's a big one. And the old guy has been nearly uh, more than 11 years on the surface of Mars. You can sit here. This is a selfie that is taken with the arm. And that's why you don't see the arm here. Take many photos, stitch them together. You get these fantastic selfies. And uh, you can see this big rover. It's one metric ton uh, mass uh, with a nuclear uh, reactor here to provide energy, antenna, uh, a mast, an arm. You don't see six wells and uh, electrical engines. Um, so, um, very uh, beautiful rover. I'm going to show you one of the instruments that has a capability to shoot laser, which is our instrument. That's what we developed for NASA. It's a NASA project, 2.5 billion of dollars. It's very expensive, but it's, it's certainly worth it. And it's certainly the most extreme and difficult, complex uh, machine ever built by NASA, except outside, of course, of the manned program. That is a still another, another level of complexity. While well, we've been on that crater called Gale, Gale is a crater of 150 kilometer diameter. You can see here with a mountain at the center. We're landing in lowlands here. And, <laughs> over, sorry, over 10 years, we've been driving, driving at the, in, a, in a crater floor here, following these dunes and then crossing the dunes and going up in the mountain that is at the center, we're still very close to the bottom, but we went up by 700 meters. We drove more than 30 kilometers, and this is where we are now. Okay, um, why is uh, why is this uh, spacecraft so special to us? Is because we have our first uh, French instrument on the surface of Mars. It's called ChemCam. Actually, it's a French and. Uh, U.S. instrument uh, built uh, jointly by our space agency, CNES and NASA. And for CNES, it was our lab at IRAP that led the uh, construction with other labs in, in France. And in the U.S., it was Los Alamos National Lab. So this instrument is made mostly of a laser and a telescope. We used to <coughs> we use a laser to shoot at rocks. We uh, we shoot so hard, so hot. 8,000 degrees that we create a plasma. And from this plasma, we can study with the spectrometers that are in the body of the rover. Uh, we can study the composition, chemical composition of Mars. This part is at the top of the mast of these rovers. I'll give you an example of a spectrum. It's slightly complex, but to show that we can detect silicon, iron, magnesium, aluminum, calcium, titanium, manganese, and so on, even hydrogen and carbon, mostly from the, uh, from the atmosphere, oxygen, and so on. So this is a very powerful technique. You shoot one time the laser, you get one, uh, one spectrum. Then you move it a bit, or you do, actually, we like doing 30 times to get good statistics. Then we move it to the next point and we do 30 shots. We move into the next point, we do 30 shots. I remember when we celebrated our first, uh, of course, I mean, this, actually, this was close to the first one, first spectrum, and then we had 100 spectrum, then we had a 1,000 spectrum, then we had 100,000 spectrum, and now we are 950,000 spectrum. So we have quite a good statistic on the composition of Mars now in the great crater. Uh, it's not only us, I mean, many instruments, we have 10 instruments together that are working on this spacecraft. Now this is a, a photo from the top of the mast and you can see the arm and the arm has the capability to drill, make good science and take some, um, some rocks here and, and go back into some uh, chemistry lab inside of the rover. 
We do great science together. By the way, look at that. We even shooting with our laser inside of the hole. So if you put all this instrument together, uh, thanks to this great rover, we were able to find, it was in 2013 and 14, that Mars had everything, energy and carbon chemistry um, and um, and energy, energy, time, and liquid water, sorry, to say that it was an habitable world. Yes, it was everything for life to develop. We didn't know yet if life ever uh, arose on Mars, but there was any, everything. That was a major accomplishment of this mission. This mission is still going on now. Um, as I say, we drove here and then we are turning, we driving inside of this um, very nice place. We we it's not easy. We had issues with our wells here. We punched holes through the wells, but I think we've learned to live with that, and we, I think we're doing okay. Uh, the uh, views are absolutely amazing. Uh, that was in 2015, very early on. We took that photo and said, well, maybe one day we'll be there. And now we are here indeed, and this is where we are here. You can see this pile of uh, sediment with all these strata that tell us a story about water, about wind, uh, putting that together. And, and this is where we're driving now. Um, I, I, I love this view. Uh, some of them in black and white is not it's still very nice. Uh, here you can see that uh, we are... Um, we're making measurements. The question is, when are we going to stop this mission? I say never. We are not going to stop it, I hope. Uh, but maybe the rover one day is not going to call home. We're going to say, I'm tired. Uh, something broke. And actually, we see it edging a little bit, but it's, it's amazing. Our engineers have been so good that uh, it's still going on. And if you ask scientists, when you're going to stop, I say never, because we always think that the best science is to come. And it could be true. Actually, last year, um, William Rappan, just next door here, uh, wrote a fantastic paper in Nature to say that it has the first evidence of a humid dry cycles. He measured this, uh, look at this view, make measurements of these uh, tiny edges here, show the angles, roughly 120 degrees. And then with analogs we have on Earth, you could say that to create that, you need to alternate between a dry climate and humid climate, dry, humid, dry, humid. And it might be good actually for the molecular evolution that uh, of, 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 um, of forms that are going to our life. So this is an interesting result that was only a few months uh, old to tell you that after 10, more than 10 years, we're still doing amazing science. And honestly, Curiosity is doing very, very well. We still are having more than 36 uh, uh, drill. We've done they have different colors, they have different composition, and we're doing okay. I think honestly, we scientists are getting old uh, faster than the rover itself. It's a great rover, okay? Um, may I ask a, a voice check just to make sure that someone can still hear me? Sure, sure, sure. So we do, we do, we do. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, was, I want to make sure. Okay. So um, let's let's have a look at Zurong. I like this one from Zurong and Chanwen Rover. I mean Chanwen program by China. We've been in contact with them. We've been working uh, with them. They're so good. And actually, look at this one. I wish we could have uh, done uh, this photo because there's no one to take it. Well, actually, usually we never take a photo of ourselves. The way they did it, here, they took a small satellite and they launched a satellite. It's a nanosat. And the satellite took a photo of the, of the orbiter. Uh, that's, very, um, that's a great way to do it. It's a great way to do a public relation. Um, so air it in space before landing. And after it landed, uh, this is the, uh, the, rov the lander here. And it's kind of a scale here for the rover to go down. This is a rover, and that is not an artistic view. That is a real selfie. Again, they drop a camera. They uh, drove back. Uh, you can see the flags. China say, I'm on Mars. And they are absolutely right. They've done absolutely uh, superb work. Uh, we can track here on the right uh, what they, um, they pass from the uh, from the. Uh, the US MRO, they, they've driven more than a, uh, a kilometer for nearly one year. 
And because of the uh, of the solar panels, they got some dust and they go lower, lower and lower in energy. Uh, it fell to sl uh, asleep and it did not wake up. Uh, it, it could still be possible. It, it's waking up. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it, it, it would, but it, it could one day wake up. But they told her they're still listening to, uh, to it for a while. One day they're probably going to give up. And that's what's happening often to our spacecraft. One day they don't call home because they're running out of energy, which is not a kind of curiosity because of the uh, plutonium. But uh, usually when you're on solar panels, your um, your days are, uh, um, are gone after one. I mean, after, after your energy is gone, you're, you're off. And just to mention here, Spectrum, because uh, there's a good science on board this rover. Uh, there's even an instrument I very much like the one we have, ChemCam, because we've been working with them and we've compared the different spectra, the one we have on our side, the one they have on their side, even the one you would see on uh, on SuperCam. And it's how you do science. It's only it's never it's never one instrument. It's a whole payload of a spacecraft, and usually it's not one spacecraft. It's many spacecraft together, wherever they're coming from. Well, wherever they're coming from, why not uh, a rover on Mars? from uh, Europe, we call it ExoMars. We started that program quite long ago. And there are many reasons for which we couldn't be ready um, because it was our first time. There's a lot of development. It was a very ambitious program. We are, for example, here in France with Spain in charge of a Raman experiment. As you know, Raman was a famous scientist in India who developed a very uh, nice technique to uh, look at molecular bondings. And we build an instrument that is, you can see here, that is now on the rover. The rover, honestly, was ready. It went under the shake uh, vibration and, and a lot of integration. And it was about in uh, February of um, last, uh, two years ago, it was about to uh, to go to its launch pad in Baikonur, Russia, because it's a collaboration where Russia was is providing a landing platform. You can see it here and also uh, the rocket. But there was a war in Ukraine, so we said, well, maybe it's not a good time to go to Russia. And we had to cancel this this relationship. And uh, that's that's important to understand that we do politics. Well, we don't. Our bosses are doing politics. Uh, because this, we think it's good to have this kind of collaboration. It's working w extremely well in space, usually on ISS. Alexei was mentioning that Russians uh, working with uh, U.S. astronauts, and uh, they're still going on every day now. They talk to each other every day. Uh, for us, we think as scientists that it's it's we need to collaborate. This time, our politics says, well, maybe it's not a good time. So forget your rocket. Try to find a rocket from somewhere else. I'm sure we can buy one. And forget your landing platform and try to buy, to build one of your own, which is uh, quite an interesting challenge. But it's going to take more years, so we, we we foresee a launch in 2028 at best. But it's still um, a promising rover, um, small rover with solar panels. It's not going to last forever, but it has a drill capability. And that's what makes it so unique. It can drill to two meters, get some uh, ground, I mean, um, rocks uh, done into a rover, and then start to do uh, the science. And you see again all these rovers together. This is a, a time scale again from uh, 3.6 and, uh, and beyond to um, 2.6 to 3.6 when this was settled in water and started to be dry. Now it's uh, the uh, the uh, mass we know today. And uh, William Harper from our published paper by uh, John Gratzinger uh, did some this stratigraphy to show that uh, Curiosity is on a very old uh, ground and it's moving up to uh, the center of the crater, which must be younger. Uh, Zorong was on a very uh, young compared to the other terrain. Opportunity was probably that same time. Uh, and you can see that uh, we will see that Perseverance is old, as old as Curiosity, and maybe ExoMars when we land in probably uh, six years from now, uh, will be on a region that is very old. 
And that's why we like ExoMars. We've selected the very old, very old landing site. He has a drill capability and an amazing instrument called MoMA that can do uh, organic chemistry. So again, not one instrument, but all instruments, not one spacecraft, all spacecraft together to do good science. Okay, well, let's now move on to what we've talked about curiosity. Why don't we go to perseverance and we call it heritage because of course, perseverance is going to be using the structure, uh, the rover from uh, Curiosity. But innovation is because now we're not looking for uh, habitability, which are willing traces of life. We had to develop completely new payload. And it's it's still a competitive approach. NASA say, well, I'm going to do it again. Who wants to be on board? So I say, okay, I want to be on board, but I'm not going to propose ChemCam. I'm going to propose a super ChemCam. So it's called SuperCam. We come back to it. And the major say, oh, I was already called MassCam on, on, on Curiosity. I'm going to call this MassCam Z because Z means with a zoom. So it's, a, it's an upgraded version and then a radar and an oxygen. Um, I come back to that one because this was important. Uh, it was important. It is important mostly for Alexi and a weather station and two instrument on, on top of the arm. So um, you have a rover, then you can adapt your payload, um, your science payload to the mission profile you have to sense we want to do this is what was done here. So 10 years later, uh, we had a second um, rover. We decided to land it in Jezero. It's a small crater, 45 kilometer, compared to the big 150 here uh, kilometer diameter, Curiosity in a Grail crater. This is much um, smaller, 45 uh, kilometer. Uh, you can see uh, at the top, there was used to be a river. The river used to carry some sediments here, create a delta, and that's what we're studying now. So. Uh, and you see where all these spacecraft are where or will be for ExoMars. ExoMars will be around that region here. Okay, well, the launch was in July 30, 2020, which is pretty good because when the project started in 2014, it was announced the launch would be in July 17 at best. So I think after six, seven years, we've been two weeks late, which is not too bad for such a big project. Uh, the landing was on February 18, 20. 21, two and a half years ago, it went very, um, very well. You know, when you land on Mars, it's very difficult. And uh, Alexi mentioned that uh, for his astronauts, it's difficult from the rover first. And astronaut will see one day that the story was here in seven minutes to cut down the uh, the speed from 20, 28,000, 20, 20, roughly 20,000 kilometer to zero. In um, seven minutes for that, you have to get a shield. And are you actually really burning on, on the shield? I mean, the shield is burning at the entrance within the atmosphere. Then you deploy your parachute. Then we acquire uh, with the radar. You try to look what the ground under. And then you drop the spacecraft. And spacecraft is going uh, for the last minute by itself to reach, uh, we call that a sky crane, to reach the ground. And then the sky crane will go off and we are on the ground. So it takes seven minutes, of course. There's no way we can interact. You just are uh, listening to beeps say, okay, this is doing okay. This is doing okay. Uh, it goes by itself. These are onboard oh, images for the parachute that was deployed. The parachute was deployed and we're seeing significant deceleration. Okay. In the so you are in the ground control room. Um, in um, a JPL uh, where everything is done uh, on the California, I mean, uh, Pasadena, on the suburb of Los Angeles. And you can hear, okay, the parachute of deploy. Great, you're all happy. So that's what's happening. There's not, not a chance we can interact. We just let it go. Okay. Wow. And after that, you can see here that this is a view that was taken on board. The images are not going to come down right away. It's going to take days and weeks to be um, sent back to us. But from that, you can re uh, build back what so was happening. So, velocity is about 75 uh, meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface yeah, of Mars. Yeah, it's one kilometer off the surface. Yeah, it's uh, rover is, is connected we to its sky crane. 
and they have a solution for landing and they're going there. They're going down. And as you can see, drifting, it's now 300 meters. It's going down on. The rockets are going to blow the dust off. This is what's up. This is down. So the two parts are going to separate. The sky crane is here with a thruster here. They're going to cut the cables, send it away, and the rover is going to land. It's very impressive. It's the first time we have this not real time because it's coming after. It takes even weeks to come down, but we have a view of what really happened. And touchdown is confirmed, which means we've landed. Uh, the rover is there, the sky crane is gone, and we are on the surface. It's very impressive. It's very difficult. NASA is very good at that. Uh, this is a one of the first view of the rover after we've been uh, driving a little bit. You can see here the, uh, the power generator, uh, the antenna. Um, uh, one, two, so actually we see three antenna. It's a big rover. We are happy to be on board. It takes us a few... Uh, Days to get um, um to get a, to have a better understanding of the of how it works and we are using it and like a test uh, pilot we are it takes about more than hundred about a hundred people at the, at first to drive this rover every day and, and then uh, we did landed here we decided we wanted to go over this delta we went first south a little bit here we went back and turned around as quickly as we can. We did some nice science here. We went up, and this is about where we are now. Um, we've uh, driven by 100, I mean, 21 kilometers in what we call 125 souls. A soul is a Martian day, it's 24 hours and 40 minutes. So um, we're coming close to the 1,000 uh, soul uh, limit, and there's so much we can do. Uh, these are some uh, views we have, boulder fields, the grid, but I can tell you that was over the summer. We had a hard time to drive through these boulder fields. We can see that's easier to to drive, and it's a suddenly a very different um, uh, stratigraphy. Um, we keep taking selfies the same way with that we have selfies from. Um, sorry, we have selfie from uh, uh, from Curiosity uh, that start to be dirty. You can see a lot of dust here. These are selfies from um, Perseverance. And again, with the arm, we, we connect many, many images, may, maybe uh, 50 of them, and uh, these are fantastic selfies. And you can see that it was just uh, drilling here. Uh, and actually, we go all the sampling. I come back to that. Uh, uh, by the way, Perseverance is not by himself. It has a friend, uh, um, a small helicopter called Ingenuity that was riding with our perseverance and uh, it's pretty big i mean 120 centimeter um the, uh, tip to tip to tip of the blades and rotating very fast because it doesn't fly well mass but it's a big success it was supposed to fly five times we are more than 60 times now so what a success and each time it flies it takes photos of where we can drive or cannot drive we can sit here from the rover this is an amazing photo where for the first time Someone else is taking our photo. This is our rover. That was a landing site. It was very early on. And here you can see on the right, uh, Ingenuity flying, and that is shadow. It has a view of its own shadow, and that's so, so, so neat. Well, uh, you can sit here. It's, it's always far away from us. You can see it after landing. Uh, you can see these four different um, landing feet. And one of them is here, and this is a shadow. So it has its own life now. It's been commanded separately for MSN. Well, it's part of the same sequence, but it has its own life. It doesn't come back to us. It's always carding ahead of us. Very, very nice. What a great success. It was a technology called um, um, development, and it is a success. Amazing. Well, as I told you, there was ChemCam on Curiosity. Now comes SuperCam, Super ChemCam. We did exactly what we did on Curiosity, which means getting uh, chemistry with a laser and imaging. But this time we added another laser to uh, look at the Raman, um, Raman um, on the ground, uh, on the ground on Mars, which uh, after it was done for the first time in India, uh, it was finally done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
a slightly less than 100 years after on Mars, but it's a fantastic technique. And we also, uh, which is, by the way, this one with a grid laser, we're also looking at the uh, reflectance from the sun, and we even have a microphone. So it's a more evolved, more complex instrument, which is what you do when you do it a second time. This is what it looks like. Um, this is on here inside of the box. You can see the two mass cam here, the two and a half cam, and here we are, super cam. That's a part that is built by uh, the Salamos National uh, Lab under the uh, the leadership of, uh, of Roger Wins and Sam Clegg. Uh, this instrument, we even have calibration targets. And um, so I'm not going to give you a lot of these results because we are, are still working on them, of course. It's a very active um, uh, process. Of course, this week it's kind of slow because of conjunction and we lack it. But I'll uh, show you a couple of results. This one, one of them, the Jezero Crater, uh, when we were about here, uh, we took a photo of a butte, and this is a butte. It's called a Kodiak butte, and where people from the team could recognize some pattern they know very well. It's called a Gilbert Delta, a Gilbert type of uh, Delta, which means they had a uh, top set, four set, and bottom set. Which he mean? Oh, there was a lake, and there was a lake with river bringing down some uh, deposits here, and the lake was here. It was not so high, but there was a lot of water. It's a, uh, it's a closed lake, which is quite hard. There's no, it's feeding one way. Maybe sometime it was going here, but most of the time evaporation was taking care of maintaining the, the lake at level. All the other techniques work fine. No way, um, no, not a chance I can spend on explaining each of them. Uh, this is microphone, this is the infrared, this is the Raman, this is a chemistry. And what's interesting with that, that's when shooting your laser two meters, three meters, up to five, six, seven, one time we did 10, you can look at the composition of a rock. What is the, uh, the, ca carbon, um, the carbonate content of the rock, of the sodium, in sodium, uh, and so on. So very interesting. Um, uh, chemistry and the microphone is kind of uh, a, a sort of science of the atmosphere and is working fine. Too. Everything was working fine. We're happy uh, team working on our data. In the meantime, the rover still uh, does its job. It's taking us here and there. We're shooting our rocks. We are making our chemistry, our mineralogy, and the rover is taking samples. So you can see it has a big harm with this uh, instrument here. It's able to uh, core inside of the uh, rock we create a sample the sample is in a tube and uh, it's about one centimeter by 10 which is roughly 10 grams and this uh, is now inside of a rover we have 13 of them of rocks one of regolith which is a soil here and two witness tubes uh, they become uh, empty they come back empty that we can make sure our process is good we still have 15 to go so it takes time uh, to acquire them. But we these are 13, but we saw that we, they're going to come back in many years. So we hope, and I really hope so, that we're still going to be alive. There's not going to be any critical problem on the rover in 10 years from now. I mean, not that 10 years, but uh, let's say six years from now. But we're not so sure. So we another set of 10 samples, uh, seven rocks, one atmosphere, one regolith, and what witness that we drop on the ground. So if everything comes uh, okay, we're still alive in 2030, roughly, the rover will take care of carrying the samples to the return uh, ascent vehicle. If not, we'll have uh, maybe, um, uh, we'll have uh, helicopters, slightly bigger than Ingenuity, to take the, uh, the, the, the samples, the 10 samples we've put aside. So, this is 10 years from now, and it's com coming to the end. I hope we still be okay. You can see, see another spacecraft coming, not too far away. Precision is important. We drive to it, and then one at a time, we're going to give it our samples, the samples we have on Earth. So we need to be alive by then, so which is a challenge because uh, it's far away in time. Uh, if not, again, they take the other, uh, the one that are on the ground. We close it. We step back, we want to make sure that uh, we're far away, we're still looking at it, and then they're going to launch what we call the Mars Ascent Vehicle. You can see here, it's going to space. And it's the first time we have a rocket uh, firing off 
another planet except uh, from the moon, of course. And then the samples are in as a second stage, uh, you're burning, burning, and then you release them as a canister. And the canister is on orbit now around Mars. And hopefully, and uh, a spacecraft is going to come and grab the canister. The spacecraft is being built in Europe, actually in Toulouse, our hometown. And then we're going to uh, contain the samples, fire the spacecraft again, so that it returns to Earth and drop the samples um, that come back to us. Remember that we have uh, samples from the moon by the Apollo program, by the Luna 16, 20, 24 from Russia, by Shanghai 5 from China. So we do have samples from the moon. Uh, we have samples from the solar wind. We have samples from asteroid with the Hayabusa one and two missions, for example, but we do not have samples from Mars and we need them. Uh, we might have some Martian meteorites on Earth, which are rocks that come from Mars, but by accident, it was an impact on Mars. The rock went to space, fell on Earth, and we were able to find uh, within the meteorite collection some Mars rocks. We call that the Martian meteorites, but it's nothing like a sample you choose by yourself. And that's what we want to do. We want to choose our samples. That's what we're doing now with perseverance. We want to package them very well and send them back to us. And it's 2033. So nearly finished. In the meantime, we keep working, of course. And I want to close the loop with Alexi. We still are preparing the astronaut to come. Alexi say no earlier than 2040, probably. I would agree. Can be possibly uh, could have an omission on orbit. Uh, around that time, mission on the surface is going to be hard, but we're still ready for that. And we are developing, for example, MOXIE. MOXIE is an instrument that is uh, more than 10 kilos in, uh, in perseverance that was used to produce oxygen. It's burning uh, CO2 from the atmosphere uh, under compression to create oxygen that when the astronaut could uh, breath or you could you recombine with hydrogen to get water, whatever you are, do, do a fuel uh, with him to return to Earth. Uh, it's only a small scale. Uh, it's more than 10 kilos, I mean, 15 kilos. If you wanted to make it one for astronauts, you probably need 100 times bigger. We probably don't need only one. You need a second one in case the first one fails, maybe a third one. So you can see that everything we do with astronauts is a super, super difficult, but we have to try because that's where we're looking at. And so, Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maurice. So you, you, uh, your presentation was uh, very uh, particularly interesting and complete, but we have some questions. Uh, so what about the human colony on Mars? Well, um, yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> you have to say right, first. I, I, I answer, but maybe Alexi, if you can still talk, you can answer after me. My my first uh, answer would be um, let's let's get honest. We go to Mars to explore Mars for science. We're not going to Mars to uh, settle forever. And I mean, the future of mankind is Earth. Okay, there's a, one planet we need to protect is Earth. There's no uh, Earth 2.0, whatever. Uh, and Mars is certainly not that one. Um, Alexei was talking about ISS, which is a great um, space station. Now think of things. Okay, I take the ISS and I put it down on the surface of Mars. You understand what I mean? Yeah, sure. This is not life. This is survival. And maybe one day we can survive on Mars. We can settle for a long time. But when I'm always scared by the word of colony. Uh, Mars is not the future of Earth, okay? Future of mankind. Future of mankind is Earth. So no. yes. I have no idea when we're going to land the first time, uh, Alexi. You said 2040. I don't know if you still um, to that. Maybe. I don't know, honestly. Okay. So according to a future of mankind, it's not the future of mankind, but Mars, is it the past of mankind? Because we have a question about that. Uh, is it a rumor that uh, Mars is the past of uh, planet Earth? It's a past in the sense that probably the, the things that happen on Mars uh, on, happen also on Earth and vice versa. 
So it's probably the same kind of process. It might have happened at the same time in a solar system. Because it's frozen in time, we say it's a past of Earth. Of course, they have nothing, they're not related. Uh, some people say, well, maybe life goes from one planet to the next. Yeah, we know that's theory. It doesn't help very much because we still need, uh, it's pushing the limit further back. I mean, so, I mean, we say, okay, life fix. Life originated from Mars. Okay, so now how, how do you create life on Mars? They say, well, it's coming from Jupiter. So how do you create life on Jupiter? So okay. it's not solving much of your problem. The two planets are separated. Sometimes they do exchange materials uh, through meteorites, but it's pretty rare. Um, it's a pass in a sense. It's it's a, it's it's a it's an intellectual process to say that Mars is a, is our past. Is to say this is a view of processes that could have happened at the same time as our past Earth, but Earth has no memory. Mm, thank you. And what about, uh, can you develop a little bit more about MOXIE? Because it's, uh, we have a question about that as well, uh, separating CO2 to CO, but CO is dangerous for human life. So can you, can you develop? Oh, yeah. Uh, C, uh, C, okay, MOXI is a very interesting uh, experiment. It was developed by Michael H., uh, 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 an excellent scientist uh, from MIT, and Jeff Hoffman as his deputy. What I'm telling you is that because Jeff Hoffman is an astronaut. He has flown five times in space. And after he retired from the astronauts, he says, well, I'd like to build an instrument to Mars to prepare for the next generation of astronauts. So the guy knows what he's talking about. Uh, actually, honestly, to uh, to turn CO2 into oxygen is, is not super, super difficult. It's extremely difficult to do it on, on Mars because of the resources you have, because of the dust, because of the uh, temperature. But it's not. And, and we know how to do it. It's not a very efficient process. It uses a lot of energy. Uh, uh, you need to... Um, to uh, to to condense your CO two first, yes, you can you can make if it's not the, if it's not perfect you make CO but we know how to filter the CO. Honestly, when it comes to that, I know we can filter and make a good oxygen. So I would say yes, we know how to do the oxygen <laughs> as a demonstrator. <clears throat> Sorry, how to make it big scale? We don't know yet, but we have to learn that. Okay. Thank you. So uh, maybe uh, we can ask two or three more questions and after we will uh, uh, stop. So how many payloads are in the rover? Um, on Perseverance, we have seven. Uh, payload is what we call payload, a science instrument. Plus you can say eight if you want to include, um, if you want to include um, uh, our friend from, uh, uh, from uh, Ingenuity. But you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, we have seven. Mox is one of them. Supercam is one of them. Weather station by Spain, one of them. Rivfax is a radar by Norway. Masscam uh, by the US. Imaging, Sherlock by the US. Pixel by the US. And uh, a good fraction of Supercam is by the US too. And Moxie US too. So it's mostly a US payload with some uh, uh, organization that have been invited. And we're very uh, thankful to NASA for that seven. On Curiosity, we had 10, uh, slightly more, because actually uh, Perseverance has a big, the sample handling part here for the sample is pretty big. So it's extra mass. So they could they could only afford uh, seven uh, instruments. Okay, so last, last question, and we uh, all want to know, and I want to know, so how would the extraterrestrial life look like? I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to know too. What I know, what I know that uh, it's probably not macroscopic. Uh, it, again, it's because of this uh, funny time scale of Mars. It's good to say that it has a good start. Uh, it's good to say that, well, it's something uh, froze. And, but the bad part is that there was probably not enough time on Mars to develop something extremely complex. Um, so it's not a rabbit. Um, uh, life on Mars is not a rabbit. You could, I wish we could see it with our camera, uh, but it's not. It's probably, a, at best, it could be some bacteria. The problem with that is that they're hard to find in situ because we are very proud of our rover, our NASA rover and our instrument, but it's still very um, hard to drive. And um, 
So the answer will come in a few years, I'm sure, when we return the samples, when we bring the samples into the lab, and then we go into details of details and in great detail, the analysis of every single rocks, every same way we've done it for the moon, from the Apollo, the Luna, and Shanghai 5 samples. And from that study, we can tell if there were there was ever life on, on Mars and what kind of life it was. Till then, I don't know. Okay. Honestly, I think there are chances. But the clock uh, went probably too fast on Mars. I think the, the, the planet turned drive and cold slightly too fast. So we'll see. But it's our best chance. It's not our only chance to find to find life in a solar system. You could go around Jupiter uh, on the in Europa, one of the moon of Ganymede. You can go around Saturn with uh, Titan. So there are other places where there are chances uh, for um, to find life, uh, past or present. But my conclusion is that the only thing I know is that there is life on Earth, and is, this is Earth. Uh, as far as I can tell. Okay, so we will uh, end uh, this symposium with uh, this message of uh, hope. So I would like to uh, thank you a lot, Mr. Maurice, and uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Payet as well for this uh, amazing uh, uh, presentation. So I hope we, uh, in the future we will do uh, some more, of course. So thank you as well to uh, uh, all the engines that uh, follow this uh, symposium. And I uh, wish you uh, a very good night to everyone. And uh, it's time to uh, make some dream about uh, the future of space. So uh, thank you to everyone. Have a great night uh, and see you soon. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for inviting us.